Welcome to Field Sports Britain, coming to you this week from Kenya. Coming up, I go fishing on a river where the evening rise is spectacular. Think you're pretty accurate with a gun? A Maasai warrior teaches me how to knock down antelope with a stick. First, I want to find out more about one of my favourite Kenyan sporting quarry, the trout. In 1905, the maverick Africa pioneer, Colonel Ewart Grogan, who had recently walked from the Cape to Cairo, ordered 40,000 baby trout from Loch Leven in Scotland, which he delivered to the rivers and lakes around Mount Kenya. Quite an undertaking. Since then, others have introduced other trout to the area. I want to see what these fish are up to today. So let's start like Colonel Grogan started more than a century ago. I'm in the town of Narrow Morrow, just at the foot of Mount Kenya, at a trout farm. Is it easy to keep trout here in Kenya? Yeah, it's easy, but you see, this fish is very demanding. So most of Kenyans cannot rear it because it, uh, it needs a lot of money to keep. I mean, it's so demanding in terms of uh, feeds, in terms of, uh, you know, work, work, work force. I mean, it demands a lot of, uh, a lot of work. Is this the only trout farm? I think area? this is the biggest trout farm in Kenya. Okay. I'm told it's the biggest. And the second one is a government-owned farm. And are these special Mount Kenya trout? Yeah, this is special Mount Kenya trout, rainbow trout. I'm told it's the sweetest uh, fish around. This trout farm also has a popular restaurant and takeaway located in a tree. It's on the Trans-African Highway and worth a stop if you happen to be following Colonel Grogan's footsteps. In a hot country where the electricity supply is unreliable and meat goes off quickly, the best way to keep your lunch fresh is to keep it alive. The biggest problems to face rivers in a country where population growth is terrifying is pollution, extraction and poaching. This is the Narrow Moro River. I'm less than 10 miles from its source on Mount Kenya. It's too polluted here to sustain life and within a few miles it dries up altogether. But I am not here to moan, I'm here to fish. Quite the most stylish way to find what are left of Colonel Grogan's trout is by chopper. If you want to go heli fishing on Mount Kenya, contact Tropic Air www.tropicairkenya.com. I'm actually going to go fishing later in the programme. First, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Britain News. The US Fish and Wildlife Service say that the price of crushed rhino horn is now more than the price of cocaine in America. It fetches more than £30,000 per kilogram in Asia, a price that threatens to wipe out the world's estimated 28,000 remaining animals. These animals were filmed in Lake Nakuru National Park two weeks ago. Since then, two have been poached. The South African Environment Ministry may introduce end-user certificates for rhino hunters. It says applications for hunting permits will only be accepted from bona fide hunters from countries that ensure horns are being used as hunting trophies, not traditional medicines. It's expected to turn down hunting applications from Vietnam. Back in Kenya, an lioness was killed and dismembered in the Maasai Mara area at the beginning of April. Around 10 young Maasai warriors speared the animal to death and cut off its tail and front legs as part of a tribal ceremony. Rangers found the trophies, arrested one suspect, while the whereabouts of the others is still not known. Some 16 lions have been lost in the area since November last year, around 1% of the total Kenyan population. No arrests have been made. The Kenya Wildlife Service has released figures about its war on the trade in bushmeat and ivory, including zebra meat. In the last week of March alone, KWS officers shot dead six poachers, including three in the Savo East National Park. They made more than 30 further arrests and recovered five guns, including AK-47s, a G3 rifle, and more than 300 rounds of ammunition and poisoned arrows. A KWS spokesman says the fight against wildlife crime continues. And finally, a hyena attack in Tanzania, which injured three people as they slept in a donkey cart, has been blamed by locals on witchcraft. One resident said cases of people being sent hyenas to attack them were prevalent. You are now up to date with Field Sports Britain News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. 
Thank you, David. More English beech tree than African baobab. Now, Africa may have an embarrassing bushmeat problem, but there is one group of people here in Kenya who are allowed to hunt. Being a lion to Leitato's warrior is strangely terrifying and also superb. If that's how he hunts lion, I wish I could too. But lion hunting by anyone except Maasai is illegal in Kenya. Instead, he's going to give me a lesson in clubbing antelope to death. First stop is the drugstore, in this case, a thorn bush called Acacia nilotica. We prepare ourselves to face the lions that we take some natural drugs and herbs. This is to try to charge the warriors and give motivation to the warriors. For them, whenever we see the lions, because the lions, I think you know the lions are bigger animals, so the warriors also must have to, to prepare themselves for that. Let's say we spot the lions in a specific bush. Then we start now singing the courageous and motivation song. So that the, the, the drugs we have been using, the natural drugs we have been using from the bush, now coming into effect. Also, when you kill the lion, you can also win many girlfriends. You can also become a famous Maasai warrior after you kill a lion. You can also be chosen the chief of that group after you succeeded to kill the lion. Because when we, we are in that competition, we don't point that uh, so and so you try to spear the lion. No, it's a competition whereby you also go and try all your level best all your level best to spear the lion first, more than the other warriors. Then that time you are declared the winner. And in that day, we make a lot of celebration, dancing with our girlfriends, with our fathers. So that day, it will be a big day for you. OK, so I have to ask, have you got a lot of girlfriends? Did you? Yeah, me, me now I have five girlfriends. So you, did you get the lion? Yeah, I killed the lion. Okay. So yeah. So you are really on your way. Yeah, you can see also the mane and also in the, our tradition that uh, we are not allowed to wear anything from the lion if you are not the killer of the lion. I feel a bit like the 1960s British politician who goes on television to take LSD. It's not doing much more for me than a glass of good claret. Next, I have a lesson on how to use the throwing stick. First, you balance the stick in your hand. Leitatu shows me foot position that's just like using a shotgun. And like a double-barreled 12-bore, Leitatu recommends carrying two sticks. He shows just how lethal sticks can be when he aims at his Maasai robe, or shuka. My attempt wouldn't knock down a small rat, but I'm learning. Now, the exciting bit, the hunting, though for Leitatu this is no more than pest control. Eating game meat is taboo for the Maasai. He feeds it to his dogs. Normally, Leitatu uses his sticks with deadly effect on game and small animals that come too close while he is cattle herding. This morning, we are going to see what we can walk up. Lurking in the thorn bushes is a dick dick, one of Kenya's smallest antelope. A group of children has seen it. Leitatu at once enlists them as beaters. They start at one end of the scrub and thorn while we wait at the other. Leitatu is not convinced that the animal is still there, so we soon call them off. The next animals to cross our path is a large family of mongoose. Leitatu is quick on his toes. We are not short of game here, but it all seems to have learned the effective range of a stick. First, we sneak up on more Dick Dick. Another couple of hundred yards, and there is an impala. The animal crossings over the muddy stream beds show the numbers of game here. And the drugs are still working. Leitatu's shot at a giraffe is ambitious. At the end of the walk round, it's been fun, but Leitatu's dogs will go hungry. I have to ask him whether he reckons people like me will be able to go hunting in Kenya. What do you think about tourists coming here to hunt? Do you think that would work or not work in Kenya? No, no, no. I think that one will not work here in Kenya. It works everywhere else. Yeah, but here in Kenya, no, not allowed. It's not allowed, but could it work? Mm. 
You get $12,000 for a buffalo and you've got herds of 400 buffalo out there. No, we don't want that. As, as me or as maybe, uh, or maybe I can suggest, maybe that one is not good, maybe because uh, it will not work. It's been fascinating and I'm glad I've added a new skill to my armoury. Look out, the rabbits, back at home. For Leitatu, it's all about the defence of cattle, but before you ask him round to defend your herds, be aware that the Maasai God says that all cattle belong to them. Can be a drawback. Now I'm off to the Bundu to go fishing. We are after mudfish, which is appropriate because recent rains have coloured the Telek River here in the Maasai Mara. My guide Reuben is not confident about our chances. Reuben is using the time-honoured method of stick, string and hook with meat on. Fishing here has its dangers. More people die in Africa from attacks by these guys than any other mammal bar humans. Here's half the reason it's not easy to catch fish here. The other half is the recent rains, making the river too muddy to catch mudfish. The mud also makes it hard to drive from river to river, so here is a short guide to getting yourself out of a hole, Maasai style. Too soon it's time to pack up, leave the torrid plains of the Maasai Mara and fly back up north to the long, cool English summer afternoon that is Mount Kenya and the Aberdares. For Colonel Grogan's trout, you pays your money and you takes your choice. Either it's a long walk or a helicopter up Mount Kenya where you can be in with a chance of a 20 pounder or you do what I do, pay 50 US dollars for a park ticket plus 5 dollars for a fishing permit and drive into the Aberdares National Park. The signs are good as I get to the Charnia River. There's another bloke fishing. He has an audience too. And there's that most discerning of anglers, a fish eagle. So we're here, 10,000 feet above sea level in a sweltering, actually currently burnt out landscape. This is more than reminds me of the book Salmon Fishing in the Yemen, where they try and release salmon into a Yemeni wadi. But this is the centre of the great dream to bring trout to Kenya, and I'm going to try and catch one. There are more reasons this is a special park. Many of Kenya's parks are open grassland. This one is high hills, forest and moorland. It's the first of Kenya's national parks to be fenced all the way round, protecting it from development, especially the rivers which, like it or not, provide Nairobi with water. And the British know the Aberdares best because 50 years ago this year our Princess Elizabeth was here at the Treetops Lodge when she heard the news that her father the King had died at Sandringham. The fishing is surprisingly similar to fishing a Scottish moorland stream but the Highland cattle are more deadly. According to one fishing friend, the only fly you need is a size 8 marabou coachman, fished wet. That's an ordinary coachman, but tied with a white fluffy marabou stork feather as its wing, to give it an East African twist. It's not as unusual as you might think. More than half the fishing flies sold in the world are made in Kenya. Visit www.fishingfliesandlures.com The fish are here, and they are beautiful to watch but the water is crystal clear, so I might as well be a herd of hippopotamus. We fished for a few miles up the Charnia River, and then my local help hears something that makes him nervous. So we fish back down again, just to show that we aren't afraid of old laughing boy hyena. It's not just the hyenas that are closing in, the weather is too. I don't recommend you do what I did, which is travel thousands of miles from the UK for a day's trout fishing in the Aberdares where you don't catch anything. But I did get to feel one of Colonel Grogan's Loch Leven trout on the end of my line, and that is worth the visit. Now it's time to slip away from Kenya and head for Wales, where Team Wild TV is hunting goats in the mountains.
We're in Snowdonia, North Wales. It's phase two of my goal to get some of the UK's biggest trophy specimens. We've come to this stunning part of the country for goats, big goats. Guiding me today is Owen Beardsmore of Service UK, who is pretty grateful we weren't here earlier in the week. Did you hear what uh, the farmer was saying? That, uh, last week they had all the snow up here. We've had three days of horrendous rain, and this is the first decent day. So, well, you're a decent outfit to so I knew that you'd have the weather organised. Not often I can uh, prescribe good weather, but let's hope we've got some today. We head up the valley from where we're going to have to walk, probably vertically and possibly for quite a while. We scan the Welsh mountains, and Owen tells me a little bit more about these hardy feral animals. It's a feral goat and it's been at liberty for over a hundred years. There's quite a few stories um, about how they got here. Um, they escaped from a farm, they were let go from a farm, from a farm originally. And um, the, the, the area that we're in, uh, there's about 250, uh, of which we're looking for um, a good quality representative old Billy, uh, which hopefully we, sometime during today we'll be able to find. So. Uh, as long as the weather doesn't come in, we should be okay. Well, they seem to be mixing, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of sheep here as well. So they seem to cohabit quite peacefully then. Yeah, um, they, don't they keep themselves to themselves. The sheep don't cause any damage. They're meant to be here. Uh, they belong to the farms. Um, the goats stay on the tops in the summer and then come down in the winter, and that's when they cause all the damage. The numbers are controlled to protect grazing and to reduce the amount of damage to the dividing dry stone walls. All you need is a herd of goats jumping the wall in the same spot and suddenly the whole lot comes down. For this special quarry species, I brought something a little bit special. OK, and we're up in the Welsh Hills. Um, uh, what toy have you brought to play with this time? OK, don't be scared, OK? <laughs> this <laughs> is a Hanel RS-8 sniper rifle. Now, you did tell me that we could be shooting over reasonably long distances. So I said to my friends at Viking Arms, who uh, normally send me Ruger rifles and Merkel rifles, that I'm going to need something that might need a little bit extra legs. So they said, I've got just the thing for you. So what do you think to that? It's, it's 5.8 <laughs> 5, 5 kilos unscoped, and then Zeiss very kindly sent me the largest scope in the history of the world, which oh, is this. Zeiss Victory Davari FL 60-24x72, um, so, which also looks like it weighs about five kilos on its own. I've got a cunning plan. Yes. We'll spot the goats at about 100 metres, drop back to about 400 and you can shoot <laughs> yeah, it, okay? Okay then. Well, hopefully we're going to get as close as we can, because we do like to make sure of our kills, but uh, <clears throat> it's not what you'd call a, a um, traditional mountain rifle. No. Um, but you're not a traditional kind of guy. No, I think you're probably right. So. Okay, let's see what we can do with it. Let's go. Owen finds a group of billies, which he tells me we need to get above, which of course means climbing. Am I regretting bringing such a big boy's rifle? Not at all. You can't beat a bit of fresh mountain air and some strenuous exercise. You know, I should be used to this by now. Every time I climb a mountain, I get halfway up and think, you need to lose some weight. And here we are again. Onwards and upwards. When we do stop for a quick breather, Owen shows us what the goats have been grazing on. This is what they're feeding on. These little berries. They go black in the end. They're really nice when they're ripe. There's, they've nipped away the tops of almost all of these bushes. So I take it the feed on the... Uh, on the berries and they start on the grass later. Absolutely. Just always picking the best food source. Oh, anyway, let's get ourselves up there. That was a good, quick break we had. Owen has a spot and reports back. There are two goats making their way up the valley and one below us. And it sounds like one's a medal. He's just over that ridge. Yeah. If we go up onto this top, yeah. the wind's great for us because we're above him. We've got a nice safe shot. He should be able to take him. He's lying down, so he may have to wait a minute for him to stand up. Maybe we've we got plenty of time. We have to okay, go. let's go with him. It looks like a gold medal. Is that all right? 
Is that all right? Of course that's all right. My goat is lying up in the heather and all we can see are some horns rising up like Harley Davidson handlebars. He can't be more than 50 yards away. But there's just a ridge, we've got to wait for him to stand up. But he's a big goat. We wait and wait. This goat is in no hurry to show himself. When he does stand, he's face on and I'm not happy with the shot. I can tell the heather's going to be a real hindrance today and I'm going to have to be patient. As he moves, another one, two, three goats rise from the heather. A couple have broken horns and would make good cull animals, but all in good time. Let's cross over that particular bridge once I've got my medal. All in a row, the older male at the front finally shows me a clean shot. He's down and the others haven't gone far, staying with the dominant male. Owen and I discuss the other animals. I'm going to take out the two with broken horns. The heather means an engine room shot is not safe and at this distance I'm confident in taking a spine shot. Both goats drop where they stand. Oh. oh what a cracker. Oh, what a cracker. Well done, mate. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Absolutely <laughs> huge. We're what a, worth the weight, eh? What a beautiful animal. Got a really good cape on him as well. Yeah. Actually, you know, it's, it's not as thick as it looks. You know, by the time you uh, just go through it, you're right down to the skin already, you see? Absolutely. Let's just look one. You can see here the exit wound. Oh, that's actually, sorry, that's the entry wound there. It was, uh, you can just see, it's very difficult to make out on these exactly where to shoot them. So if you imagine, there's its shoulder, that's the bottom of its chest, that's the top of its back. So although it looks halfway up its body, it's actually, just in the right spot. Yep. So you can look how old he is in. So with a goat, obviously, he doesn't cast, so you get the growth. It's just a domestic ibex, really. So you've got one year, two, three, four. Now hold on. One, two, three, four, five, six. No. What a beautiful animal. Now, you told me that they're a bit smelly. Yeah. But actually, after following you up the mountain all day, this smells quite pleasant. <laughs> the second one. Now, this is kind of a, a bigger one. Obviously, he's got one broken off. So why is it important to take these ones out? Well, um, the problem you get is when they start rutting and they're fighting each other, they don't connect. So uh, uniformly, and uh, that can cause a lot of damage to the other billies. So it's like an unfair advantage. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily kill them, but what they end up getting is like a fly strike, and it's just like on sheep, so they die a really horrible, slow death. So um, it's a good one to take out, and we, any of the broken ones we try and take out. So, uh, but he, if he wasn't broken, he's still a pretty oh, good yeah, size animal, isn't he? What is he? One, two, three, four years old. Mm. So uh, still smells as old as his dad, though. Now it? this one smells nasty, <laughs> uh, but the uh, nasty in the other one. Now this one obviously, we uh, he didn't pre present me with a um, uh, with, with a heart and lung shot. So as you can see here, I took him in the spine, um, but he went straight down. Yeah, but the bilberry was up to there, Ian. So yeah. he did well there. No, but it was a lethal shot, and he dropped on the spot. He did so indeed. Well done with that. All right, let's get him back up then. Let's go and find the next one. Oh, so same story with this one. Like, yeah. So it must age. take some force to break these off because this one's yeah. still really thick at the base. Not as long, maybe, as you'd have thought, given those bases. But four, what, five years old? Yeah, I think four. again. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, five mm. year older than the other ones. So yeah. Exactly the same again. This one couldn't Ooh. couldn't get a shot of his heart and lungs, so he went high in the shoulder, took him through the shoulder and through the neck this time. What? To what grain bullet were you using? Um, 185 grains, so you told me that they don't like to go down, so with a 308, 
normally I'd only shoot 150, maybe up to 165 grain bullet, uh, but seeing as I knew with your skills you'd be getting close, 185 grain Lapua Megas, and uh, they've certainly done the job today. Certainly did the job, yeah, well done, good shooting. Good, let's okay, get them down mate. there. Let's get, these, uh, let's get these down before the steep descent. Just time for a quick picture with all three billy goats gruff. So we've had a fantastic day. We've done a lot of climbing, we've got the trophy we've been looking for, and we've taken two with broken horns. But now the hard work begins. We've got to get all this down there. This has been Field Sports Britain. Motivational, courageous and unremittingly British. <laughs>